So, good afternoon. We're back in here, another woodworking wisdom. And I don't know, I hope you're all right. Where have you been? What have you been up to? So, 24 hours, things are a bit different. I went out last night, I got mugged on the way. Look, it's different. I don't know, it's like, it's so, so much nicer. Freedom, they call it. So, I've got this funny badge behind, shows my hair, so, hair boys. Okay, so hopefully you're all okay. Um, we did, I think yesterday, marking out video using a a knife wall technique. Really valuable little tip. Now, we've had a few good questions. I will answer those or try to answer them during the afternoon. As you already know, we have two guys sat here. We've got Colwyn, who's sat on the computer, taking your questions. So if you've got anything you want to know, let us know. We'll see if we can answer it on the spot. We've got Craig doing all the computer stuff and the camera bits showing. Okay, so hopefully going to keep up to date. It's quite a task. It's fun. So today we're going to look at halving joint. We're going to go over some of the tips we used yesterday, but we're going to do a halving joint. So what is a halving joint? Okay, join two bits of wood together. So we want to do this. Now this is all about basic hand tools, not machine stuff. We've got the wood machine, you could say, but these interlock. So this is all hand cut, and you kind of saw how I had to take that apart. It takes a little bit of effort. Okay. Should fit together nicely, not fall apart. Nice joint, quite accurately done. This can be used different places, I suppose. And people say, you know, what are you going to use this for? So I've got the trivet that we made for the kitchen thing, right? So this was part of the Christmas campaign we did. So all interlocked carving joints. So that's real basic scenario. That would be a good one to start with if you want to make. You can put your hot pans on this in the kitchen. Keep them up off the work surface, but nice, simple little thing to make. Real easy. And it's going over those techniques we're going to do this afternoon. It could be used in something like a gate, wardrobe construction, a whole range of different tasks. Your imagination, once you start to get into this, will help you, you know, design what you want to do. So this joint is a real traditional joint. A lot more strength than adding something like two biscuits either side and gluing it together. So going to go over how we're going to do it. All right, so let's just get this out of the way. Don't want that. We don't need that. I don't want you to think I'm cheating when we get to the end. So, more bits of wood. Okay, we've got those. A couple of bits of tulip. We're going to need some tools. So, let's get our toolbox off the wall. What do I want for a minute? We've got marking gauge. I've already got out. outlet. So, I've got a cutting gauge. I want my square. Knife. I'm going to leave the chisels for a minute. They're easy enough. Put that back up. Marking knife we had a question about yesterday. So Japanese marking knives, different sizes. And it's something I hadn't really thought about considering, really, when I started. And I've got two sizes. We do three currently. We do a 12, 15, and then there's an 18. Which one do I use? Why do I prefer? I prefer the middle one, the 15. Just a bit wider. I've got something to grip nicer. The blade length becomes a little bit longer. So it gives me more usable surface. So the 15 I tend to prefer, I find the 18 just a little bit too chunky, but it depends on your hand size. So little thing, okay? But Japanese marking knife I use a lot. We'll explain why in a minute. So we've got our bits of wood. We need to lay these out. I've got to get the glasses out. Let's uh, explain things as we go. Now I've got a few different tools out on here today. Going to get that little platform we used yesterday. So Craig's got that on the overhead on the front there. Look, that'll be good. Leave him there for a minute, Craig. So this little block had a couple of questions about this. And this was originally done really to help do the video, to show you what we did yesterday. Um, didn't design this as a, an aid to help me do the joint. I could have done it in the vice. But actually having thought about it, this makes it so much easier. It gets me up off the surface of the workbench. I'm not risking cutting the bench or the vice. A bit more clearance. So what we got on here, we've got a piece of birch ply. Three screw holes in here hold the pine button on the back. On the other side, we've got two blocks in line, screwed down, give us clearance in the middle to do different cuts. So actually I can use both sides. We can hold it in the vice easily. I can flip it over. Really usable little thing. And like I say, it wasn't intentionally done to throw anyone or, you know, but it's a great thing maybe to have for your workshop. So easy to use. You can use it a bit like a bench hook. 
The other side we used yesterday, so we've got a chisel surface we can go up against without risking splintering out the back edge of the timber. It's supported against those fibers. So quite a nice usable little block. So that's something that will probably get stored in the cupboard in here. All right, really nice to use. So quite easy to make. Now I said you were gonna do our joint. We want to interlock them. I'm gonna aim more for the middle because it means I've got support either end and it makes it easier to show you on the camera what we're doing. It's as simple as that for that reason today. So glasses can go on. We've got a bit of wood, no real issues with anything on here. We want to put our rail, and normally you measure this out a little bit more to be quite precise on where you want it. As we said yesterday, if you go with something like a pencil line, you get quite a thick line. So we want something thinner. Knife is so much easier. And I've got different squares we can use. We could have large Japanese square, engineer square. Either will work beautifully to give me a nice support thing. I can clamp them on, I can hold them, okay? So engineering squares, a bit better than metal. They are a bit more precise in my liking. Colin, what have you got? So this one's from Frederick. This is a question on the marking knives. Is it true that there are left-handed and right-handed marking knives? The bevels are apparently different. In reality, from what I can see, and I knew this was going to come up as a question, most of what we sell is actually a right-handed knife. You can get actually get some left-handed. I don't know if we sell left-handed. Bear with me. We do do... Craig, can you go overhead? Number three. We do do... Point one, all right? So we got on there, okay? So that's got your point on the top. So, okay, bear with me, you'll see it better there. So it actually comes up, so you've got a double face. You could use either as left and right. Most of the knives obviously are designed, sadly, for right-handed people. So this will be right-handed, I can hold it with the flat. Um, they're a bit difficult to adapt to be a left-hander because there's a hollow ground, you're gonna waste a lot of material cutting it back. So the double bevel, if you're naturally left-handed, would be better for this task. The other thing I said yesterday about using a Japanese marking knife, it is flat-backed. So in reality, when I run it against the square or whatever I'm holding against, it's gonna give me a nice crisp line on the back and a square shoulder. If we go with something like a Stanley knife, if you think about it, the blade on here actually cuts to a dead taper as a knife, all right? So you get that bevel either side on your blade. That's gonna create a V. We don't want a V, I want a hard crisp shoulder on that back edge. Hence the fact really I'm going with something like the marking knives with flat back. Even a scalpel has a double bevel. Some of the blades will have a single. It's worth inquiring or looking at what you're buying, okay? So hopefully Colin, that helps you on that one. So we've got our pencil line. I don't want the pencil line too much. I want a knife line, but my pencil line gives me a measurement point. I can come up to it. My knife and my square. Now my square, look at my left hand, really going to work here. I'm just gonna grip the square. So fingers on the back, thumb on the front there, clamp it in, slide it up. Now I can position the tip of the knife on my pencil line onto the, draw it towards me. First few strokes, not too much pressure, not pushing down too much. As I go in, I can repeat this and people sort of think, yeah, what are you doing? We're just making this a little bit deeper. So we've actually now got, I hope you can see, camera two, nice crisp line in there. Okay, bring it up a bit. Let's see if we can get it to focus on the timber a little bit. That looks good. You can see that nice crisp line, a little bit of depth to it on the edge. Won't be apparent yet, but there's a little bit there. Most people would assume at this stage, you're gonna mark out your length of your timber for the width of the other joint. We can, but actually, I'm gonna do that thing we said yesterday that I don't use very much. That pencil, I want a guideline very lightly. So to help you guys, I'm just going to do a little arrow there. That gives me a guide of where things are. Why don't I do that now? Because I want to cut one side, lay it in, and then get the other side cut. If I lay it all out now and I'm a little bit too far out, got no adjustment. So we're going to work on one side to start with. We want a side depth on how deep we're coming down. And again, I'm going to do tiny line, and I can go back to my knife just for this, I'm trying to make sure I'm not blocking this with my head, just to do a little bit. I know I don't need to come all the way down. Now, deliberately, we're going to repeat it on the other side. I think you can see that. I can even slide my knife along, tilt it a little bit. It'll drop into that groove. All right, so we come along there. It'll drop into that cut we've already made. 
I can extend that down. Going to use the tip. That lines up nicely just to break those fibers on the edge. So my knife line comes around. We can't use the cutting guys like we did yesterday because we're not on the end. It's not long enough to get down here. So we've got to use something to get in there. We have our pencil line that I put here as a rough guide. This is the only reason I wanted this line. A little bit there, a bit on the back. Turn it over. I want to know how far down we've got to come here and where we're coming up to lengthwise with that cut. So the pencil lines look a bit heavy at the moment, but they give me a guide. So the idea of having the pencil line, see where we are there. I've got my cutting gauge. So this has got a sharpened wheel. I've already set it up. So this is halfway. So I can turn it round, it will be central. Now if I'm checking for central, I can push it in with my wheel. And I did do this earlier, save a little bit of time. Get it central, position it. So from there, going to pull it towards me. I can stop on the knife line that I'm coming up against. Again, I can do two or three strokes with that. Flipping over. Now don't go over. We've got to actually go round. So we're working on the same face with the gauge. If you start turning it over, you're going to get a difference if it is slightly out. So we're there, 180 degrees. So we now have, and I can probably highlight this as long as I can get the pencil tip in, get a line in there, one there. Around. So bring it up here, we have our knife line, have our gauge line on the side to tell me how deep we want to go. That looks good. You can see that, that's nice. So we've also then got this at the moment, is our block up to here where the pencil line is, how long that needs to be. First stage marked out and done. If you were doing a bench of these and they were the same, you could actually clamp them together on the bench. So in reality, something like sash clamps or something, pull them together and mark them out at the same time. Right, we just put the G clamp on the board, hold that. It's up against those two blocks. Now, the reason for using the two blocks, I've got a way of coming through everything here, nothing hindered on the back. It gets you up on the bench so you can see what you're doing. Quite nice, that's good. So we want a chisel. Got a 20 mil chisel, nice and sharp. We've got our knife line that we've already cut. We're gonna do that break wall now. So with the chisel, push it forward. Leaning it a bit, let's get back a bit. So this is seven of those fibers. We've got the flat edge of the chisel down towards the workpiece, the bevel face up. Not too much force, definitely no mallet. If you start using a mallet, yes, you'll probably chip the fibers. Now we've got this fluff on here we need to remove. This is recapping really what we did yesterday. Slide the square up to my knife and I've dropped it back in that groove. Pull it towards us. That's put the knife point in a little bit further. Hopefully, and just clean the bottom of that out. Last go with the knife just to sever those fibers off. So again, I can slide my knife up to that wall, bring the square in just to support it, keep everything nice and square with the handle, with the knife. So right hand, create that nice lip, one fibre. Now I will say, like I said yesterday, I'm hoping we're not offending anyone by trying to do this. This is, it's taking you maybe to a little bit of extreme. This is fine furniture making. If you're doing cabinet making, you might, you know, okay, you do that. The joinery guys, well, it might be a bit over the top, but it's giving you a lovely crisp shoulder. So we've got that nice V, it's come down a little bit, all the way across, fantastic. First bit done. Clamping back in, just gonna move those, put my chisel back out of the way because that's nice and sharp. Then we wanna saw. Got a number of things. Now we said about the saws yesterday, so traditional, this is actually cross-cut dovetail saw. 
we can go Japanese so a few of the guys ask questions on different things um, I know Colwyn's got one of these in the turning room when we do this this is a little bit flexible back but slightly stiffer this is a back saw so it's got the stiffness on there either will work we said yesterday also we're doing this look at what you're going to buy as a saw Get yourself familiar with various different techniques to this. So the Japanese saw I've got in my hand is pull saw. It cuts coming towards me. Western saw, tenon saw, dovetail saw, cuts pushing away. They have different techniques. They get a little bit of getting used to. Japanese saw, if you get it wrong and you push it and try and cut, you bend the blade, fold it a little bit. So it takes a little bit of practice coming. Now, if you were going to use your Japanese saw, and it's pulling it, and you haven't got anything clamped, you'd be better off the other side of the block. Come down. But it's so much easier to clamp this down. It doesn't take anything. Now, I know we've said with the board, and we explained how it works, so now what I'm actually doing, hey, can you go to four, please? Just try and get the guide an idea. We've got the clamp. It fits right underneath underneath the vice. Clamps the work up. So it gives us a way of holding everything right down to there. Really good for that. So the clamp's coming right down to the bottom of the vice that we've got. Bring that in. So it locks everything in place nicely and so simple. Bring them over up against the side stop. Okay. So, what should we go? We'll do a mixture. We're going to do the Japanese one because I want to give you that indication of how easy this is. I've just dropped into that knife ball that we cut with the chisel, slide it up, pull. So as long as I keep my saw on that shoulder line and not twisting across my body, pull it towards me, dark up. I want to support it. I can stretch my fingertip carefully. Now I'm deliberately dropping the handle down on towards me. So camera four will show you that better. So I dribble it when getting to here, drop the handle down towards the floor because I cannot see that line. Far side. What I can do is turn it round, then work on the other side. So cut what you can see, not try and cut everything. So this side we've turned it round, cut down to our depth. Those Morton cuts we said about. Now Japanese saw will cut a little bit faster. Going to do the same technique we've just done. Again, by clamping it down on the bench, so much more helpful with the Japanese saw, basically pulling towards you with the blade. If you haven't clamped it, you're going to fight against holding it and doing the cut. Ooh, I'll do a little bit more. So again, I've worked on the side I can see, down to my gauge line. Flip it round, put it back in place. Work on the other side. I want to get down to the gauge line on the bottom, the brake line. Try and get the saw nice and square. Using the saw one-handed, we've got that finger on the top. So we said about the tenon saw, I might do the other half of this with the tenon saw, we'll see. That was pretty good. A little bit on this one. That's good. Move those out the way. Chisel now. We we started with 20 mil wide. Can't do what we want now with a 20 mil. Well, you can, but it's hard work. So we're gonna go half. Go get down to 10 mil. Maybe not. Let's go to the 12 now. Look. The floor is not going to help us with that. Right, okay, so we're going to go 12 mil. A little bit wider. Now, we come down in size because we want to take little bits out. If you go with a big, wide chisel, it's a lot of effort. You're going to push it through. It's going to, it's going to strain it a little bit, and I want to do this by hand. As we said yesterday, don't go using mallets too much. Yeah, the chisel is designed for a mallet, but if you can't push it, you need more force. Not a safe. Other thing I've done, drop my handle down again. I'm pushing up the bevel, face upwards. So knocking the tops off, really. I'm aiming to come upwards. I'm not coming all the way down to where the scribe line is. 
working across that length. Take a bit out the middle. The other thing which you'll notice probably, where are we, camera four, I'm not coming all the way across. So we haven't touched fibres on the back yet. Because you can't see the brake line, you also run the risk you'll splinter them out. So we turn it round again. We do the same. In the middle to get. Now the left hand, if you look at, I've gone to that grip. So I'm pinching with the fingers and thumb. That's acting as a break. Stopping how far we're pushing through. Because I don't want to come all the way across. So we stopped again. Let's just do a quick turn round. Exactly the same on here. bit to get there. Just taking a bit out of the middle. Okay, that looks good. We cleared out most of the waste. As we said yesterday, it would be lovely to go with something like melter pine. We could set the deck, we can, but we don't all have those. So, would be the ideal case to use it. So we're going to, have to turn that board over. Clear things. Better. Lock it back in. Craig, can you go for free for me? Up above. That's it. Good. Sorry, mate. All right. So on there, I just want to see where we're central on here. That looks good. I can put the clamp. Fantastic. Up on there. So we've got our groove, the bit of pine in the back is going to add some support. They've already done a bit like we had yesterday, a piece of plywood, a bit of a brazier I can put in. I've got different thicknesses, so a bit of oak. That touching with my bearing surface now so I can get my chisel back in, support. Now, I said about the abrasive. Why have the abrasive? It stops it slipping when you're working with it. Quite, quite effective, just a bit of double-sided tape, stick it on. Big chisel. Small chisel, either will work to start. I've still got a little bit to go this side. So the pine block on the back, what's that doing? That's stopping any breakout if I come all the way across. It also gives me a nice firm surface to push up against. So again, I'm not fighting it on the bench. Smaller chisel. Less effort again. Getting down to where I want to be one side. Check everything is clear. And the most important thing, sharp. So make sure the chisels are nice and sharp. They take less effort. Push it through. Really pushing down my fingertip now. Get that nice and level and equal all the way along. And first bit. Turn it round. So again, we're working from either side, coming across to where the middle is. So we set back up with the clamp. Small chisel to start with. Again, got a little bit of a block to take out. Handles down low, so it's not sat flat. Fingertips on the left hand, just supporting, allowing the handle to drop towards the floor. Take a little bit. <sighs> Got a little bit of a lump just in the middle there. So again, with the small chisel, it'll take a smaller cut. It'll make it easier to get in there. 
less effort for me. Just coming up a bit. Sliding up towards that end. Okay. Hopefully that should be quite good there. Pretty small problem I want to get rid of. So I've got to get rid of the waste. Need to just turn this round. I can probably. And up on the top. These fibres on here. That's got off. Look, that was good. Just need to get back into there. So just a little bit on that centre. That bit there. Bring it back in. Not up against our bit of pine. Ugh. So we shift it back. Our chisel. So hopefully we can stand this across a bit more. And then we've got to do the shoulder line on this end where the arrow is. Got to get that right in a sec. Ground again. Small one, which I can see, but a little bit I want to get out of there. So starting centre, working out towards the edges. Clean out the waste, level it back. So this time now we've got our thumb and the fingers doing a lot of work on the left hand, pushing that chisel down nicely. Like I said, nice router plane would have been great to get into here, but it's given that scenario, not all of us have that sort of thing. A little bit in the corner to get in a second. Wonder if we can come in from there. Got enough support from the shoulder line from the knife we've got. Push down firmly. Now this shoulder where I'm working now, right in the corner, that's the one we did with the knife line. This is the one we've got to sort out yet. Gonna flip him back round. I want to check dead level. Oh, a bit too far over. Let's come back a little bit. Gonna line up on the underside of the vice to make sure I miss the dog hole or the vice or the clamp disappears a little bit. So we cleared out most of that waste. Great camera too. Can we go to okay. So that looks nice on here. We've got good flat surface in here. Nice square shoulder this side. This edge we've got to clean out. Got to clean back. Got to come back a little bit. Got a little bit in the corner. We're going to go. But all of this is actually nice and clean. Leveled off really nicely. So. We'll flip our board back over. Again, this is really about going to hold it nicely. Put our clamp back in. One our width. So, first thing I'm checking now, I bring the edge in of the, the board that we're going to put in. Does it fit squarely? Difficult to show you, but that fits beautifully across there. There's no gaps, there's no tilt, it's nice straight. Got to be a little bit careful with this bit because you don't want to tilt that down. So if we tilt the board too much, we'll drop it out a square. If you measure corner to corner, slightly wider. 
So we want to bring it back into the same manner it's going to drop in. Got to hold it gently. I'll use my knife. I'm going to create a small line. Got to turn it round. Why do I need to turn it round? In reality, maybe that goes back to that question we had earlier about left and right-handed knives. The backer here is flat. It's difficult for me to hold the square the other side and draw it round. So I'll come on to there. We've got a tiny little dent I can drop that into. Locate it. So trying to make sure into that groove. Few with that. Let's see if we can take some of this out just from here. Okay, what I wanted to know. Come up just a little bit. That's the bit I want to get rid of. Carefully just dropping the chisel into that edge, just create that V. I want to clean it back out. So, knife again, I can slide up, rest it on the back of that face now that I've already cut. Position it, lock in with the left hand, keep the knife nice and square to my body. Pull it across, clean out the bottom. Oh, which one's I'm going to go? Talon saw. I can bring it in. I can rest it up against that knife line now. Nice and gently. Checking where we are. Looking on the front edge. Can't see the other side until we flip it round. Drop the saw back in, fingertips on the left hand. Find just a little bit of pressure, keep it straight. We've dropped in the groove, we've got very little chance of catching the saw blade. So drop back in. That's good. Chisel. Probably. Get most of that chisel from there. A bit shy with my saw cap on this edge. I think we're getting enough. So I started there with the bevel downwards, less aggressive for that cut. Now I know I've got a tiny little build up towards the middle where I haven't quite got the saw possibly flat across the cut. So hopefully we can use the bearing surface of that knife line we cut just to clean that up. Down in there. Change bigger chisel, a bit more support. Clean out anything. So let's have a look. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Right, if we go to there, then Colin, Colin, we got them. 
So can you just remind us what plywood they're using to make the um, the jig there? So I can... What plywood you're using that's to make just, that? That's uh, just... You could use anything. But, I mean, we, we in here... Um, if we make patterns or anything, we try and use good quality birch ply. I find it more stable. It's flatter. It stays flat. And I know we're talking to the other two guys that stood here. You know, Colwyn used it for quite a few things. Craig, we've used it for you know, routing templates, whatever. Headphones, uh, I would class as far eastern ply, tends to warp and disorientate a little bit. So on something like this, I want it to be flat as a surface. So it's quite important you get something flat. This is 18 mil, I think. 15 or 18 mil would be a good thickness. You don't want it too thin again. You want it to be able to support the blocks. If you're regularly going to use something like this, make it, make it sort of last. You could actually glue these down. So that could be quite nice. Right, okay, let's have a look. We're in there. So this is what we just cut. Can have a quick look? Now, this should, apart from, see where we are. Will it fit? Not quite. So I'm a tiny little bit on the shoulder with my arrow. Tiny little bit to come off. Clamp. Back in underneath. Fingertips are just feeling other things as well. Make sure things are right. Nice. I want a little bit off here. Not easy to take a tidy bit. I'm toying with a couple of ways of doing this, but knife line won't hurt as long as I can draw across. Trick with this bit now, quite like pressure. Not easy. I want to see what we have. Nearly going in. Okay. Fine adjustment tool. And we talked about this when we did the hand files and the rasps and stuff. Japanese rasp. So these are carb as well. Fine. I said you about we can tune it apart from I don't want it resting on that. Just that face. What I have got to do to do this is get support either side, not push too too much pressure, too much weight behind it. I'm trying to keep everything equal. Slide it across, create that crisp shoulder line. So therefore, oh, that fits in nicely. That's good. So something there is a little bit different. I know when we did the files and rasp, we talked about that sort of thing. We have a joint now that will actually fit over there. Okay, so we can position. I don't think we're going to come back a bit. Just so I'm more central on a bit of wood. We'll do the other half. My knife. Carefully. Got one. So this, obviously, if you're doing this on a project, you measure out maybe with a ruler and you're going to get it to where you want. I've set it up just so it makes it easy so we can see it with the jig board when we do this. We've done... Couple of knife lines there. I've got to turn it round. Why have I got to turn it round? What's the reason for that? I want to use the back edge of the knife again against the square surface. The minute I come the wrong way, or I'm trying to pull it towards me, the bevel's on the wrong face. So I've got to have that flat edge on our workpiece. So we now have where we want to be. What do we want to cut out? I'm going to go deep with a knife line. So I'm coming up to position, slide in. So I can get the knife so it just drops into the groove. We could check it central. I can use the tip on the edges better. I want to deepen those. Make sure I get the square shoulder on the back. Do the other one. I'll turn it round again. Slide the knife, drop it in that groove. A 
little bit of pressure pulling through each cut's extending that down a little bit going to create our knife wall i've still got to do the cutting gauge marcher but i just thought while we're here it's positioned i can still do this now Again, I want to slide right up to that shoulder. So I position the knife before bringing the square up. Set it up nicely. A few more little strokes through there. Should hopefully clean that one out. Once we've got it out, top face down to there. Draw that through. Flip it over 180 degrees, checking where my pencil lines are or the knife lines are so I can make sure I stop in time so I don't go all the way down through. Going to turn it round. Chisel again, but we want to do a couple of these. Let's add a break line a bit more. Little bit deeper. So again, we position the knife, square up behind, pull it across. Chisel, bevel up, couple of cuts. Do you think we'd severed those fibers? These bits will break off. Now, the idea with this knife ball effect gives me a positive start point to do the saw cuts. Clean out the bottom. So the knife goes in, square up behind, pull it across. I've got my line behind, so saw first into there, checking where we're down to, that's good, going to do the other end. one in there to bit take it out so again we're tilting the saw down towards the floor a little bit because i can't see what happens on the other side so I flip it around up against that knife wall we've done fingertips are just working on the left hand to support the blade the, the cutting edge is below the surface this side i need to probably be left-handed Better. Trying to come down to a scribe line there, we cut with the cutting gauge. Our marking gauge would probably be a better term for that. Cutting gauge would be across the grain, but the Veritas one has a wheel, so it'll do a bit of both. Oh, 12 mil chisel. So I'll push those up. First side, flip it round. Handle down low again.
Turn the chisel over so I've got the bevel face downwards. Stop it going in as deep. Take the waist out the middle. So we're still upside down with the chisel. Add a bit more support from behind, so we're going to swap that board back over. Ooh, smaller to start with. Take a little bit, again the left finger's working, acting a bit as a break, stop us going all the way across. The chisel gives us a better bearing surface on our block that we're using. This is taking the guesswork out of our oh, height. Give us something to sit on. Years ago, I would have tried to do this without anything underneath. And it's, it's hard work, so why not make life easier? Most of you have got a scrap piece of wood we can put in there. So take the bulk out. So we turn the chisel over so we're not going to go any deeper. Just taking off the high spots. Back over towards the middle now. And just turn the chisel back over now so we've got the flat down. Handles down a little bit. Got a high spot. Well, I messed with my saw a little bit. Need to get my line a bit straighter through there. So uh, this is taking the bulk out still a little bit. Feeling what's going on, where have we got? Got a bit through there. Thought it was quite good until I put my fingertips in and suddenly realised there was a bit of a step in the middle, so we weren't level. I'll just flip over once more, hopefully. My knife, I can bring up to the wall edge, square and behind. I can raise the handle. Maybe this is one of the reasons when we said about the Japanese marking knife yesterday. I've got a nice long 40 mil section of knife blade I can use here. So as I'm going deeper, I can actually raise the tip up, but still get support in behind. So really good for that. So I can either go there, up to that, drop the tip down a little bit. I've got support up on the square. The knife's quite short. Don't get any support in behind it. Okay. 
my little lamp there. One side, got to turn it round, but you want to do exactly to get the same and use the back of the knife of the support again. Got to come up a little bit so I can get the square in. Try and get central on my board to make sure you can all see. That's what I'm after. Big lump there, really. Just to clean up that last little bit in the bottom. Fingertips, what's happening? Right in that corner. So again, let's have a quick look up on here then. Bring it up, see where we are. Now, to give you an idea of clean, I can move my pencil across. There's no little steps. So it's dead flat, either way. So nice flat surface, we've chilled it. It's equal thickness, we're down to our gauge line. Nice corners cleaned out, maybe a little bit there, but I think we get away with that. Let's have a look. So I'm hoping it should, maybe. Might need a tiny bit out, we haven't tested that. A little bit, okay. That's that one. That there should go then. Temptations to get the mallet out. Nah. Put it together with a square, with a vice. So we're there now. At the moment, a tiny little bit high. So is that Got to go in? Okay. Which one should we adjust? Let's do the one with the pencil. We need to go fractionally deeper. Board back in. Clamp back on. Make adjustment to my board. Take a line of a brazier off. So I've got a couple. I, I was apprehensive on where it was going to be. I know, you're thinking I overcut the bit of oak and needed to put two bits in, probably. One side, looking back round. So this is about just taking that little bit more at the bottom. So left fingers working nicely, pushing down. So I'm only going to trim the bit out of that one. I don't think we need to do both. Put it this way. If you stop and have a look first, then you can reassess things, maybe adjust it. Again, want to squeeze this together. It's quite tight there. Okay, so what do you think? Let's have a look up on... That's pretty good. Holds together. That's quite nice. Lots of strength in there. So, let's have a quick look on, what a mess. Colin, you've had a quiet afternoon, I'm sorry. Hopefully, we're going to get lots more questions and see what we are. Hopefully, guys, you've, you've enjoyed what we've been doing. Um, as I said to you yesterday when we started doing, I haven't done hand cut joints for 30 years. So, this is a learning curve for me. It's quite fun to get back into this. Hoping this is showing you some simple little tips. So, the board thing, like I said, wasn't done as an idea of helping you do this it was done more for me to show you what's happening but actually works so well for this gives you lots more access allows you to hold it safer that's paramount 
sharp chisels and things are paramount. If you don't know about that, have a look at the sharpening things we've been doing. They are there. Hopefully you've enjoyed this. I'm back on Tuesday. I'm in the wood turning room. Okay. Uh, Colwyn's in Wednesday doing some sharpening. Craig's going to do a tennis racket thing he's been walking around with, wasn't it? Was it a tennis racket? Craig, what do you use it? Uh, oh, sorry, chopping board. Um, so we will see you next week. More woodworking wisdom. Thanks very much. Hope you've enjoyed it. Bye.